Okay, here we go. Just a couple more chapters. We're down there towards the bottom in the red. We're going to, today we're going to talk about the, the amphibians. And what I want you to remember about the amphibians is they're the ones, they're the uh, animals that make that uh, gap more or less between life fully in the water and life fully on land. They live life uh, a little bit of both, right? We talked about the tadpoles and the metamorphosis and the, the egg, which we'll talk more about that today too. Remember, this is something that we've seen as a very much of an interesting parallel between that and plants. There were those plants that were that way too. Mosses, for example, and the algae that live on the coast. Some of them could live up on the land, but they had to be, you know, they had to be wet as well. So that whole idea of desiccation, which, gosh, we started so long ago talking about when you move out on the land, is once again, uh, you know, presenting an obstacle. But the amphibians figured out a way to get around that. The amphibians figured out they could live part of their life in water and part of their life in land. So that's where old Ichthyostega came in, right? In the upper right, Mr. Ichthyostega. So, you know, now take that picture up there of the lobe uh, finned fish and then Tiktaalik and then the early amphibian. And they're kind of in order. Tiktaalik fits in between those two. But, of course, remember, take that and understand that there are many other gradations between that. There are many other species that arose that gave rise. It wasn't just low fin fish, tectolic, and early amphibians. Well, these were the highlights, at least the ones we see in the fossil record. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry, Madison. Yeah, what's up? You have a question about the portfolio. Uh, so you've got the ca uh, categories established. You go in and, um, oh, geez, you go in and the pictures are there and you click on the picture, then you click on the category, you click on, can I, can I look at it right after class? I mean, it'll take me a second. I just got to look at it real quick and remind myself how to do it. But yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah, if you won't just stay on till uh, when I'm done, it'll just take me a minute as soon as I see it. But off the top of my head, it's something one way where you pull up the categories and click on the pictures or something like that. The ones that fit in that category. Remember, those are due what tomorrow, tomorrow at eight o'clock, not class time. They're due tomorrow at eight a.m. Remember, that's the that's the time that your field notebooks. Uh, the links have to be sent to me. All right, uh, back to the uh, Ichthyostega. So Ichthyostega was that critter that kind of bridged that gap between life fully in the water, life fully uh, on land. It lived in between. It was the first or one of the first early amphibians. But again, its egg, like you see in the lower right, well, not Ichthyostega's egg, but amphibian eggs are tied to the water. They are an anamniotic egg, which we'll talk more about when we start uh, actually discussing the reptiles. But all right, let's take a look at the amphibians. About 6,000 species, three major groups of them. So, um, you know, not like the plants, but that's relatively speciose. Remember the plants, you know, when you're talking in the vicinity of millions and quarter, or I'm sorry, uh, hundreds of thousands of species, like in the flowering plants, uh, 6,000 species. But this is a relatively specialized species, too. Uh, first vertebrates to walk on land, all right, that would have been, again, the ichthyostega or ichthyostega-like. Uh, right about 360 million years ago at the end of the Devonian. So the end of the Devonian, so see pink Cadillacs drive. So the end of the Devonian would have been as we were moving into the Carboniferous. See, I still use those little mnemonic devices, pink Cadillacs, Permian, Carboniferous, Devonian. So when the Devonian was ending, remember the Carboniferous? Remember why they called it the Carboniferous? Carbon, carbon, carbon. There was plants everywhere. Plants, carbon. Remember, that's the stuff that made coal. So as we move out of the Devonian into the Carboniferous, uh, Carboniferous 360 million years ago, then what we're getting there is we're getting, you know, this uh, 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 we're getting this gradually warming, wet climate, swamps and marshes, all kinds of terrestrial arthropods are moving out into this wet, very much conducive environment, not so drying, not as drying uh, as, you know, uh, deserts and things to come later on. But uh, the, uh, the uh, arthropods then, of course, would have provided a lot of things for amphibians to eat. 
And then being able to move out into wet terrain and being close to water, you see that fits very well with their lifestyle. So they would have been the first ones to crawl out on the, uh, on the land. So crawling on the land means you got to have legs. Now, uh, Ichthyostega had legs. Ichthyostega had front legs, also had rear legs. But remember, Ichthyostega, we think, kind of dragged itself a little bit like a seal, right? Uh, so it would have moved on the land with a much more a sturdy front pair of limbs than the, than the rear pair of limbs. But once we get to the amphibians, we get organisms that – you know, have a much more functional pair of legs. They're spending more time out on the land now. They can't, uh, Ichthyostega was probably more of a live in water, crawl on the land every once in a while, forage around, you know, head back into water kind of thing. Uh, but frogs and toads and, 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 their, and their relatives can stay out of land or can stay out of water longer than that, obviously, can stay in, in, in even drier climates. But legs, okay, legs are the big things. Uh, that would be an added patient to life on land. A fin does you very little good like that little tadpole there in the lower right has got that, uh, well, it's got legs and a, and, and a tail. Remember, <clears throat> the tail is going to fall off. Uh, but that doesn't, that's not going to do you much good as far as propulsion on land unless you got legs. Now, there are other weird amphibians. The one in the picture, the little the black thing, it's not a worm. Even though it's segmented and everything, it's really bizarre. But that is actually an amphibian. It's, it's what we call a Sicilian, C-A-E-C-I-L. And uh, they live an interesting, they live a burrowing lifestyle. So they live underground. They live in dirt. Now, interestingly enough, many times organisms that live that burrowing lifestyle, especially those that were, uh, were tetrapods, these are all tetrapods, four-legged things, right, uh, have, have, have lost their limbs through evolution because limbs are not efficient necessarily underground or the limbs become very small and reduced. There's a skink, a sand skink. We have uh, we have found one on campus actually. It's a it's a protected species, but uh, it burrows into the sand and it lives just barely underneath the sand. It's got very small front legs. So uh, Sicilians in their burrowing lifestyle are kind of uh, you know are the amphibian version uh, of 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 you know things like the, the those lizards and things that have moved back into uh, into that burrowing lifestyle. Uh, lungs, because gills aren't going to do you much good uh, in air. You can't use them in air, uh, but you can also supplement your respiration with something that we uh, we haven't talked about before, but we have sort of mentioned before in this thing of called cutaneous respiration. Cutaneous respiration that some amphibians can do is, is they basically can supplement their oxygen exchange uh, by passing thin capillaries, blood capillaries, uh, through uh, thin layers of tissue at the surface of their skin. So what are they taking advantage of, right? It's, it's diffusion again. So if you look on the right-hand side, and I'll explain the purple in just a second, those capillaries would move through the lungs uh, and or, because there are actually some amphibians that don't have lungs at all, but and they would pass through the skin of the animal where just like in the flatworm and just like in the cnidarians and just like in the uh, the earthworm, right? It's all about the diffusion and all that stuff that'll take care of the exchange of gases. You remember I told you any tissue uh, that has a lot of blood vessels that is highly vascularized, that's what we mean by that, uh, and is moist will conduct gas exchange naturally, diffusion. Car carbon dioxide will go from high to low oxygen, you know, just like... Uh, just like you learned about in, uh, in bio one. All right. Um, also, a pulmonary circuit. Now, since we have lungs, which we didn't have before this, we have a need to pump blood through the pulmonary circuit. So now there's a two circuit loop uh, on the right hand side at the top. The pulmonary is the loop that's going to go through the lungs and or the 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 skin, right? Uh, and again, I'll tell you about what the purple is in just a minute. And then the systemic is the blood that's going to go through the capillaries of the rest of the body. So just like in our system, a little bit of a variation, obviously, but just like in our system, uh, blood is pumped in two circuits. From your heart, it goes out to the lungs, back to your heart, out to the body, and then, of course, back to the body, right? So first time we see that is amphibians. Remember, fish had a single loop. It was like a racetrack. It was like uh, it was a, a, a heart, a pump basically in line with the tube and just was pumping stuff around and around through the gills and, and around and around. <clears throat> now, what allows you to do when you have a separate circuit like this is you can now increase blood pressure because 
you're pushing blood through smaller and smaller capillaries. You can increase blood pressure to tissues, and that means you can deliver more nutrients or more oxygen. So you're up in that metabolic rate, right? What's the whole idea behind the purple? Well, you notice how many chambers there is in an amphibian heart. There isn't, uh, what was there? There's two in the fish. Uh, there's, there's not four, there's three, right? Uh, the way the amphibian heart works, and, 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 and remember, let me caution you, in, and when we're talking about organisms and evolution, that this doesn't mean that this heart is ineffective. It is completely effective for the way amphibians lead their lives. It wouldn't be effective for us. But what the purple is, is we're talking about mixing of blood. So when the deoxygenated blood comes back from the, um, from the body, so that would be this loop. Oh, it does work. There we go. This loop there. And the oxygenated blood comes back from the uh, gill or excuse me, the lungs or the, or, or the skin. Uh, they are each received in their own atrium, but they're both dumped into a common ventricle. Uh, the pumping part of anybody's blood is going to be this thing called the ventricle. We just happen to have two of them. Amphibians got one. So when they pump, the blood goes out and then is split between some of it going into the capillaries and some going in the body. Now, the purple color that the artist is trying to demonstrate is that blood is mixed. It's, it, it's part oxygenated it's, and it's part deoxygenated. So it's not, it doesn't contain as much oxygen as the, as the red, but it has more than the blue. And red and blue, of course, make purple in this artist's representation. Now, as I said, uh, does that work? Well, yeah, that increases the efficiency of the circulatory system by creating these two loops increasing blood pressure uh would it work for higher metabolic rate critters like us you and i no we could not live on mixed oxygenated blood we're going to have to have blood that's fully oxygenated so we're going to see later on you know that we have to add another chamber okay moving out on the land involves some costs right obviously so we're seeing an increased metabolic rate is one of those costs okay let's talk about these different groups of uh, amphibians some of them you're real familiar with. This one, for example, these are the frogs. Uh, a nora, or nora means tail. Frogs don't have tails. Uh, that's where the word comes from, a nora, except when they're tadpoles, obviously, like you see in the middle. I think that's a neat little picture. It's kind of the uh, progression of a uh, 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 of an a nora, a frog or a toad, from an egg through the uh, through the the tadpole with the tail and losing the tadpole. There are a few uh, frogs, by the way, as adults that do have tails. There's one in the lower right I showed you, just to show you there's always exceptions to all of this. Uh, the difference between frogs and toads, okay? Frogs are smooth with moist skin for the most part. The green tree frog uh, on the right would be an example. Uh, they tend to, tend to have longer legs. They're big jumpers. They jump long distances. Bullfrogs, I've seen them jump all the way across uh, a two-lane road before. Most of these guys uh, with their moist skin and such are going to live uh, most, a, a predominant amount of their life near or even in the water. For the, If you're walking down around the, the, the lakes, these are the critters you're going to see. Toads, on the other hand, like this eastern uh, <clears throat> toad here, uh, it's got more bumpy, drier skin, uh, shorter legs, hoppers. They don't do a lot of jumping. They do a lot kind of a hopping. You know what I'm talking about when you see them move. Uh, their dry, bump, or bumpy skin is is an adaptation that's going to allow them to live in moist, or excuse me, drier climates. So these are these are the amphibians that might have pushed the envelope of where amphibians could live. Okay, now as I said, reproduction and what you're seeing down in the bottom, uh, well, in the middle there, that's a that's a bullfrog, that's a Florida bullfrog, and on the left are two frogs, and they're engaged in something that we call amplexus. Amplexus uh, is uh, frogs. Uh, the, Frogs copulating, basically. You can see the eggs that are being created. The female down below will spawn her eggs. Fertilization is external. The male that's clasping her will then uh, will then release sperm, and the uh, fertilization will occur in the water. You're obviously going to release a lot of them then because you're basically, it's what we call broadcast spawning, right? Everything just goes out in the water, and we see what happens. The eggs have to stay in the water. As I said, they're what we call anamniotic eggs. They are eggs that will dry out if they're laid on land, they have to be laid in water there. And once again, is the fact that these organisms have one foot in water and one foot in land. A lot of times you would think these are prey of things since they're so, uh, you know, soft body. But for example, up here, these are, um, 
South American poison uh, arrow dart frogs. They're, they're brightly colored. Again, this is an example of what I was talking about. What was in the last lecture about coloration and like the butterflies and wasps and the fact that sometimes critters are, oh, oh the nudibranchs. Remember the, the, the uh, marine slugs that are very brightly colored? And I said, holy cow, we think about that from an evolutionary perspective. That makes no sense. These guys are the same way. They secrete a poison, a toxin, onto the surface of their skin. And so much like a lot of uh, toads and frogs around here, if your dog, if your dog ever gets a hold of one of them, they'll get this reaction in their mouth, this frothing because of the material on the surface of the skin of the toad is uh, makes the dog do that. And hopefully the dog remembers never to do that again. It's kind of like that comedian Jeff Foxworthy talking about the television sitting on a TV set when we were kids growing up. You pull the TV down on yourself, the idea was, well, well, won't do that again. Well, the idea with these frogs being brightly colored is the same thing. The uh, poison dart frog color or name comes from the Indians down there used to use their uh, blow darts that they hunted with, and they would touch them to the surface of the skin of these frogs. And that toxin, it was, I believe, a paralytic toxin, so you, you get paralyzed, uh, was used as uh, on the tip of the spears to kind of succumb their prey. So if you're not big and bad, you can just be, you know, awful to to, to eat, I guess. Uh, these are the salamanders. Now, salamanders we don't see a lot of, and that's too bad. Uh, one of my favorite salamanders is this one down here, if nothing else than because of what it's called. This is the red-spotted newt. Now, there's nothing different between a newt and a salamander, right? I don't, there's nothing even technically different between them. They uh, refer to the same thing, but this, we do have red-spotted newts in Florida. I've never seen one in Florida. I did see one in Vermont one time. We also have the dusky salamander over here. That's a Florida uh, of This is the one I was talking about. The sal now, salamanders are in the group Caudata. Uh, they have tails, right? Very much different than the, uh, than the frogs. A long body's tail, smooth, moist skin. This is here is the slimy salamander. The slimy salamander is found um, here in Florida. You can find them in the Wakaiva State Park. They're, uh, they're lungless. That's a lungless salamander. They retire com or, or, or rely completely on cutaneous respiration. Uh, salamanders don't typically get real big. I, I think this one up top, I think that's a cool picture. You know, he's, he almost looks like he just doesn't want to get his belly wet. But look at the one down below. This one's not, they're usually pretty small, but this is uh, Indonesia, I believe. That's the world's largest salamander. I think their size is going to be limited in some degree by the fact that how much they rely on cutaneous respiration, right, for reasons that we've talked about before. Um, these guys uh, have internal fertilization, so they're not going to be like the frogs in that amplexus position. They're going to actually engage in, in – and it's done very in, uh, interestingly. The males present a sperm packet. This is uh, – actually, there's someone's finger right there. This is a uh, salamander sperm packet. He presents it to her, and she accepts it or, or rejects it or, I don't know, negotiates it or whatever. I'm not sure. Kind of interesting way to go about it. The, the larvae are similar to the adults. Sometimes the larvae will have gills when they're, uh, when, the, when they're developing in the water, which they will then lose. There are some that actually live in the water all the time. Uh, what In Florida, the, this one here in the net, this big black thing looks like a snake. It's called a siren, uh, and it, it has gills. And if they live, and these are um, amphibians that spend their entire time in the water. We used to catch a lot of sirens up at Lake Jessup when I was uh, in graduate school up in the weed line. There'd be tons of sirens hanging out there. Okay, so that's the two bigger groups. This is a group that most folks, who, if they know anything about uh, amphibians, have uh, don't know much about this group. This is the Sicilians, the apoda, the legless, the burrowing ones. Now, they did, they did have a legged ancestor down here. I found online this is what we think the ancestor of these critters look like, the legged ancestor looked like. So again, we have this idea that legged creatures moving back into a burrowing lifestyle. See down there? That's how they live. That's a bunch of them. It's like almost like worms. Uh, it's beneficial they're going to lose their legs because legs are drag. It's easier to move through uh, subterraneanly by pushing your way through. Uh, the segmentation you see there, there isn't segmentation like in a worm. That's how they get their traction. Right, so they're kind of they're almost a little bit like a snake. I'll call uh, snakes or reptiles. These aren't snakes. 
um, burrowing lifestyle, small eyes. We talked about this whole idea of being a biological detective, right? Hi, Suzanne. How are you? You know, the idea that uh, if you were to look at a creature and examine it and notice that it had really small eyes or blind, you might think, oh, it it lives in a blind uh, a cave, like a blind cavefish, or it's a burrower. Uh, very unique mouth. There's a picture of it. No, uh, no shortage of teeth. Interesting looking critter. I found something interesting about their reproduction. They're also internal fertilizers like the, like the salamander. So among the amphibian groups, it's only the frogs that are external fertilizers. They're going to fertilize in the water. Uh, regardless, the larvae of these organisms have to have to develop uh, uh, in the water for the most part, at least in moist conditions. Uh, among some uh, apodons or some Sicilians, like you see in the picture on the right, this is the female, and all these little marble things are her offspring. Uh, they will actually uh, develop or they will actually obtain nutrient from the mother by eating her skin. Uh, the mother sloughs skin. The larvae will consume this mother's skin. So even, you know, again, we talked about maternal investment in sponges, right? How the, the sometimes the uh, the developing embryo will develop inside the mesohyle of the female sponge. So there is this idea even among critters like sponges and even among these amphibian critters of some type of maternal investment, right? Of giving your offspring a, a chance. I, I think it's interesting how this sort of meta evolution process occurs. Um, okay, so we got the reptiles and the mammals, and the big thing about them after we uh, after we added legs uh, is something called an amniotic egg, which we'll get to that. Uh, no, we'll get that in the next slide, actually, when I'm looking ahead of myself. There we go. This is the amniotic egg, the amniotic egg. All right, let's start uh, in the middle. There's the embryo. There's Junior. And if you have an amniotic egg, then uh, Junior, they're surrounded by that sac in the color it's blue, known as an amnion. Now, of course, if you're an amphibian, remember, you're an amniotic, so you don't have that uh, blue uh, tissue. These are extra embryonic membranes, right? Remember part of the uh, totipotent cells that we talked about in embryonic development. Inside that amnion is the amniotic fluid in the amniotic cavity. The amniotic fluid in the amniotic cavity, ba ba ba, releases the egg's requirement to have to be laid in water. Because the amniotic fluid, remember we talk about a female getting ready to give birth, her water has broken. That amniotic fluid is liquid, and what is that liquid's job is to prevent the fetus from drying out. Okay? So there we go. It encases, it protects the fetus, it provides a little bit of a shock absorber floating in, uh, in that water. Um, uh, other parts of the egg, the yolk sac, which is uh, kind of like the endosperm and the angiosperm, is a little bit of food. Uh, the Atlantis, uh, the Atlantis is where the waste product from the uh, uh, from the developing embryo ends up, right? So that's where all the nitrogenous waste. A and the chorion, very often the chorion will actually push uh, right up against the edge of the egg, because even though like even in a in a chicken egg that outside the egg like, seems hard, it's permeable, but the chorion will sometimes push right up against the edge of the egg, uh, and that's where gas exchange occurs. Now, what happens in mammals, I don't think I go into detail with the mammalian egg, but what happens, and we can go ahead and stay here, what happens with mammals is, it's for one thing, it's a reduced yolk sac. Uh, obviously, we have the amniotic sac, and the chorion and the atlantis merge together and form the placenta. So it's the chorioallantoic membrane, and that becomes the placenta, because the placenta in mammals does that, exchange gases, that's how the offspring or that's how the baby gets oxygen or the uh, or the developing embryo that's how waste products are carried away so you know this is a self-containing once mom lays this thing there's nothing else she can do it's all got to work right until uh little junior there pecks his way out of the egg but the big thing about this of course is the fact that you have an amnion right now you can lay your eggs away from water you have to go back to water to lay your eggs so you can be a dinosaur like that komodo dragon on top they lay eggs that's got sort of a leathery uh, uh, appearance to them. You all know about Komodo dragons, right? One of the one of the fiercest reptiles out there, Komodo dragons. We'll talk more about those here uh, in just a second. Uh, all right, the reptiles, dry skin, 
which allows them to prevent water loss. They have scales. They have keratin. Uh, think about uh, crocodiles and alligators with those things we call scoots, you know, those uh, really heavy plates that you find on the backs of these organisms. Well, a lot of times what those do obviously is protection and, uh, you know, physical protection, but also protection from, from drying out, from losing water, from desiccating. We're changing the breathing too. Remember, amphibians were buccal breathers and then swallow the air, right? Now we're going to move to something much more efficient, something that really inflates the lungs much better. We're going to breathe from the chest. So we're going to have a diaphragm, right? We have a, pl a, a pleural cavity where our lungs are found, and we have a diaphragm below it. And because of the physics, you can't see me. When the diaphragm is pulled down, it creates a vacuum and air rushes into our lungs. It's more efficient than buccal breathing. You know, it, it, again, the caveat, just to make sure so I can ease myself, remember, buccal breathing works for amphibians. It's not one's better than the other. Thoracic breathing would be necessary if you wanted to get bigger, more uh, metabolically active, like the dinosaurs down below, right? Because those are the reptiles we most know about. And then, of course, the birds. The birds, that, that's very metabolically active, what birds do flying, right? Um, okay, now the heart. The heart is still three chambers, so we're still mixing the blood, but we do have a partially divided heart. You can see I've indicated the red arrow there. So we're minimizing the mixing of the blood. We can drive up the metabolic rate just a little bit. Now, we're still going to be dealing with ectothermic critters. We're still going to be dealing with what we call uh, cold-blooded critters. We're still going to be dealing with critters that engage uh, when it comes to body heat predominantly or completely uh, with something we call behavioral thermal regulation. You're walking down the sidewalk and the lizards are laying on the sidewalk and they go, go, go scooting across. What they're doing laying on the sidewalk is they're warming up from the concrete. They're behaviorally thermal regulating. We do it. You know, if you're cold, you go outside, you sit in the sun, you're behaviorally thermal regulating. But us mammals also can thermal regulate because of our metabolic rates. So the reptiles don't have that. Now, reptiles except for birds. Birds, like us, are also uh, not ectothermic, but endothermic. We uh, have our own body temperature. Birds are warm-blooded. Birds are warm-blooded. Don't get confused with this whole idea of endo and ectothermic because there are some organisms out there in which they can raise their internal body temperature. But what we mean truly by endothermic is you maintain a stable body temperature. There are some sharks, white sharks, for example, that uh, they can raise their internal body temperature after a big meal which allows them to speed up the metabolic reactions, of course. But all they can do is raise their body temperature a few degrees above ambient, whatever it is around them. They it can't maintain, a, you know, like us, a 37 degrees Celsius. Now, birds can. Birds have a very high metabolic rate. Now, we'll talk a little more about birds later on and about all that. But uh, that's going to be that's going to be requiring a much more efficient heart. So among the birds and crocodilians, crocodilians are actually more related to birds uh, bird reptiles than there are to the non-bird uh, reptiles. They're very, they're very closely related to birds. Crocodilians, alligators, mammals. We have a four-chambered heart, right? Crocodilians do, birds do, we do. The other reptiles, other than crocodilians and birds, have that three. We won't say three and a half. And maybe some female uh, nest attendant. We, uh, we in the picture there, as it implies, we've actually found fossil evidence that. Uh, Females may have uh, may have tended the nest. They may have actually engaged in uh, what we call anting behavior, where females, closely related females, would take care of each other's nests. So they might have been, they might not have been so brutish as we as they've been portrayed in the movies. Earliest reptiles about 310 million years ago. Okay, so as this Devonian period uh, is uh, is uh, uh, is a dwaning. We're going to the Carboniferous. Uh, among reptiles, one of the first thing that goes on, especially, well, not especially, but if you think about it, driven by being on land, is we're going to modify the skull. Skull is a very heavy object, and you got to keep your head up, especially in, in, on land. So in water, having a heavy skull wasn't a big deal. Now, if you look at in the upper right, I'm showing you three types of mammalian skulls. Turtles have an anapsid skull. The hole that you see there is the eye orbit, okay? An anapsid skull has no holes other than the eye orbit. 
It's a big, heavy skull. If you're a turtle and you're aquatic, not a big deal. You can deal with weight underwater. That kind of skull with no opening, that anapsid skull, is going to be beneficial for critter. Not beneficial. It's going to be okay for critters living in water. But if you live out on land, you're going to have to lighten the load a little bit. So among other reptiles, for example, among things that we call mammal-like reptiles, you think, what are mammal-like reptiles? This thing down here, this is a mammal-like reptile. These are therapsid reptiles. Now, they're reptiles, okay? They're reptiles, but they're not lizards. They're not snakes. Uh, they're not dinosaurs. They're a type of reptile that's gone extinct. They have a lighter skull. They have one with one hole, a synapsid skull. And then other reptiles have two holes in their skull. Birds really have this. And if you think about it, that makes sense, right? Birds are really thinking about weight as being a premium. So they have two holes in their skull. So we see this gradual lightening of the skull as, as, as organisms move on to land. Organisms are now getting bigger. Uh, Dimetrodon, down there in the middle, is the, the critter with the big sail. Now, Dimetrodon was actually, Dimetrodon is actually not a dinosaur, right? It always, it's always in, mixed in with the dinosaurs. It's not like that Tyrannosaurus there on the right. Dimetrodon was one of those mammal-like reptiles that died off. Not a dinosaur, not a lizard, not a snake, not a turtle, but a type of reptiles that's not around anymore. But they got really big, Okay. And they were able to start killing things and, and, and eating prey uh, their own size. And then, and then among the diapsid reptiles, the other reptiles during the tri Triassic period, right before, well, as just, uh, well, no, just as the dinosaur era began in the Triassic period, 248 million years ago, uh, we start seeing the diapsid uh, reptiles. And that's the tuataras. Maybe you have never heard of those. We'll talk about them, the lizards, the snakes, and that and the dinosaurs, the archosaurs. The archosaurs were the first land vertebrates to be bipedal. Get up on your hind legs. You can see your prey. You can see who's coming after you, and guess what? You can book, man. You can run, and you can chase things down. Right, so among the archosaurs, we have those who became bipedal, a lot of the dinosaurs, the pterosaurs, and, and the crocodilians. Obviously, crocodilians didn't become bipedal. Dinosaurs dominated for 150 million years, and then they all went extinct, except for the birds and kind of the crocodilians. Think about the birds as being uh, dinosaurs and the crocodilians now as being more the cousin of dinosaurs, if you think about relatedness in that degree. But as I said, we'll see a little bit later on, too, when we look at the mammals. There was all these different kinds of, of reptiles that were forming and, and dying off. And, and only the lizards and the snakes and the turtles and the tuatars are around today uh, and the crocodilians and all that sort of stuff and the birds. And then amongst those ones that aren't around are these therapsid ones, these, the, 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 these mammal-like reptiles that looks like a little rat there. They replaced the pelicosaurs, the dimetrodon critters about 250 million years ago. Now, they were synapsid skull critters. We think they were endothermic. We think they were endothermic because they had a hair-like covering on them, which means they had a reason to want to stay warm, which is what your hair does. Now, most of these guys, these types of reptiles, these therapsid reptiles went extinct 170 million years ago. But one group of them, with, with a few more changes, a few more steps down the road, finally gave rise to the mammals. So now the mammals have the upper hand, right? See, like that picture I see down there? There's the Tyrannosaurus and the squirrels. Oh, now the squirrels have got the upper hand. I think about that when lizards chase, when Cooper's chasing the lizards on the back porch. Mammals rule now. Okay, let's go through the reptiles. Yeah, and get through the birds today, I think. Let's see. Uh, the turtles. Oh, back to the turtles. Uh, we're not sure exactly how turtles are related. The phylogeny is somewhat unclear. They are reptiles, of course, but where they branch off from the other groups of reptiles, not really sure. It's a relatively ancient group, small group, only about 335 species. Thing about turtles is they have the shell, right? They have one on the dorsal, one on the ventral, the dorsal being called the carapace, and the plastron being called the ventral. Tortoises, which are, are are terrestrial, like the gopher tortoise, you can tell because they have a domed carapace, and aquatic tor turtles tend to have a disc-shaped one, like uh, 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 soft turtles or uh, uh, chicken turtles, like you see in the picture there. Let me get my thing to work. 
or uh, marine turtles like this. Uh, looks like a, is that a loggerhead? Yep, yeah, looks like a loggerhead. This is a green turtle, green turtle uh, egg hatchling. Green turtles uh, or sea turtles crawl up on the beach, and the female lay about a hundred eggs in a clutch. Group of eggs in a uh, reptiles is known as a clutch. Among birds too. About 100 ping pong shaped, uh, shaped eggs, and then about 50 days later, they'll come crawling out, and they all try to make their way to the beach. Uh, make their way, I say, because a couple things along the way, like the ghost crabs, like to pick them off, and then light. They 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 run to the area of the sky that's uh, brightest, which is usually over the water. But with human beings living on the beach, having lights at night, they will sometimes crawl the other way and end up out over the uh, the road where they get run over. Um, now, turtles don't have teeth, but they have really sharp beaks. I'll show you the one at lab, so they can definitely do a, do a job. They're, they're known for being, uh, especially sea turtles, they eat, well, obviously sea turtles, eating jellyfish. They have interesting adaptations in their throat by which the jellyfish can go in, but they can't come back out again. Uh, there's a gopher tortoise burrow. Gopher tortoise burrows, this is a gopher tortoise, they're always easy to tell because they have that D shape because of the domed carapace that we find uh, on tortoises. So tortoises usually land uh, land critters. Uh, leatherback sea turtle, huge, biggest sea turtle out there. Alligator snapping turtles. You want to mess with them, they'll take your finger right off, man, I tell you. All right, so that's a smaller group. Um, turtles, the tuataras, oh, even smaller group. Tuataras is only a couple of species. Uh, sort of a living fossil organism again, only found in uh, certain areas of New Zealand, now highly protected. My son was in New Zealand, and he said you can only see them in zoos and on these uh, conservation areas that are really difficult to, to get into and see. Love these critters. They look so cool. They look ancient, right? Uh, the original distribution was much bigger up until the end of the dinosaurs, but now, like I said, they're only found pretty much for the for in New Zealand. Uh, Cats, which were eating their eggs, were the one of the main problem. Where did the cats come from? Well, people brought them. That's not unusual on islands. Many critters that live on islands have lost the ability to have a fear, if you will, of a predator because they've never dealt with that predator. So human beings come and bring their cats, and the cats are like, wow, look at this stuff. It doesn't even run away from me. Same thing happens with a lot of the, uh, the uh, flightless birds on the island of Guam. They're called rails, these flightless birds. They never dealt with cats. People started uh, bringing their cats to Guam. Cats get out and do their cat thing. And these poor birds get a bucket because they're not used to it. Same thing with the tuatars. Um, tuatars had this really neat thing that I want to talk about. It's called a parietal eye. And I'm pointing to it in the picture. The little red arrow is pointing to this spot, kind of like the mandroporite in the, in the sea star, right? The little spot between the eyes on the top of the back of the head of the tuatara. It's a, it's an eye with a lens and a retina. For all intents and purposes, it's an eye, but it's just under a bunch of scales. What that eye does is it senses circadian rhythm day and night. Now, studies have shown that if you take an organism, including human beings, and you put them in a room with no light cues, in other words, they don't know when the morning starts, when the day starts, and when the day ends, that your natural brain will begin to drift that your, your brain isn't exactly on 24 hours. And I don't recall the specifics of how, you know, how much it drifts, but through time, what will happen if you put somebody in this room and you say, okay, go write your daily activity, but you have no light to know if it's day or night, no way to know. When you come back, their breakfast hours and their sleeping hours will gradually have shifted. Now, they won't be aware of that, but it'll happen. So what sunlight does for many critters is it resets you. All right, sunlight comes up. Okay, it's daytime. Boom, everything goes back. This is, you know, so whatever that drifting occurs gets reset every day when the sun comes up. That's why sometimes people who live in chronically cloudy areas like Seattle get depressed and kind of lose track uh, of time and 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 just kind of day or night because sometimes there's no there's no cue to it. Um, so these organisms get that in their parietal eye. Now we have a sense. But we have a need to sense that as well. We need to regulate our circadian rhythm. But uh, if you cut away your hair, you're not going to find a parietal eye. You don't have a parietal eye. But what you do have, what you do have is something called a pineal gland. There it is right there. Does anybody know what uh, your pineal gland does?
maybe from an A and P. Pineal gland regulates your daily, daily hormone rhythm. All right, so what has happened in mammals is the parietal eye has uh, recessed further and further into the brain. Now, how does it sense light? That's a little deep into the brain. This thing right here, which is the optic chiasma, that's where your optic nerves cross. Your right eye goes to your left brain, vice versa, and they cross at a chiasma. Familiar word, right? They cross there, and the pineal gland receives uh, input from the optic chiasma due to light. So when you see the sun, the optic chiasma sends a signal to the pineal gland, says it's day. And that's how we set. See, we're related, us and the, uh, and the tuatars and the other reptiles. They're not the only one that has this prior to lie. It's just a real obvious one in them. Squamates, uh, the lizards and the snakes, we put them together in spite of the fact that you think, well, gosh, they, they're different. But really, a snake is nothing more than a, a legless lizard, a lizard that has gone, uh, or, or a reptile has gone to the, the legless lifestyle. Uh, but first, let's take a look uh, the, uh, at the lizards. But overall, among the lizards and the snake, this is the greatest diversity among the reptiles, about 8,000 species, except for the birds. There's 10,000 species of birds. They're the most diverse of all reptiles out there. But uh, lizards and snake come next. Uh, one of the characteristics of these organisms is they have uh, hemipenes, they have paired male copulatory organs. I don't have, I, remember I showed you the claspers on the shark the other day. Uh, sharks, and we're going to see in lab on Monday, sharks have two claspers. I don't have a picture of hemipenes on this one. Let me go to the next slide. There they are. This is snake hemipenes. You've asked why two? One malfunctions, one falls off, <laughs> one gets bitten off, you know, sometimes, oh, can they do two female one? No, no, it's a backup. It's kind of kind of left over from the backup idea of kidneys in, 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 in the worms, right? Uh, lizards, many of them have the ability to regenerate their tail. Sometimes you can tell, like in this uh, tiger gecko, or no, sorry, leopard gecko over here, you can see the tail is different. Uh, and sometimes if you look at uh, some of the anoles uh, crawl around campus, this is the green anole. Don't see as many of those. That's the native one. This is the brown. That's the non-native one. That's the Cuban or non-native anole. If you look at their tails, I've noticed that sometimes a tail it'll be a, it'll be sharper, and then sometimes I see tails that are not as sharp. And I wonder, did they get? That's not very good drawing. Did they get bitten off, or is that a tail they regrew? Because they will regrow uh, their tail. You only get one other chance, though. That tail actually gets cinched off by a sphincter muscle. If they feel the threat of a predator, they'll pinch that sphincter muscle. Sphincter muscle is any muscle when you tighten it, works like a drawstring, tightens up, and it pinches off the tail. Tail flips around, you hope the predator goes after that so you can crawl away, remember? Just distract them for a minute. Komodo dragon there in the middle, one of the uh, only organisms or animals that are known to actively hunt human beings and consume them. They oftentimes will bite somebody, let, and because of all the bacteria in their teeth, they'll let you crawl off somewhere and die from infection because it's easier to eat you after you're dead than when you're trying to thrash around when you're still alive. As awful as that sounds. Big critter, three meters, 135 kilos, 270, 280 pounds. The Gila monster down uh, in the bottom uh, in the American Southwest, I lived out in uh, West Texas, never saw one, but I'd love to. That's a Gila monster, brightly colored. And the beaded uh, lizard there on the right are venomous species. So there are venomous species of lizards. But the Komodo dragon is not venomous. Its teeth doesn't have venom. They just have all these bacteria that are growing around their teeth. They have a really dirty mouth. They wouldn't kiss their mothers with that mouth, maybe. Uh, we have and uh, a gecko here in Florida, not native. This is the Mediterranean reef gecko. I see him in the building an awful lot at school. Uh, geckos, big eyes, large toe digits, always trying to sh sell you insurance. Mediterranean reef geckos, they got here because they came over on ornamental plants. They're not... They're exotics, but they're not invasives. See, the brown anole is an exotic because it came from Cuba. It's also an invasive because it's out-competing our green anoles. It's running them off. It's killing them off, destroying them. Uh, the Mediterranean reef, go, reef gecko is an exotic because it came from, well, the Mediterranean, but it's not an invasive because it's not causing problems. 
A lizard I see not a lot of, but enough and really beautiful is the uh, blue-tailed skink there on the right. Gorgeous, gorgeous animal. Very obvious, right? Everyone saw somebody gets one of those in their field notebooks. Uh, so that's the lizards. Um, snakes, on the other hand, had a legged ancestor. Uh, there's the fossil evidence. This is a fossilized uh, snake or an ancestor of snake, excuse me. And you can see that uh, it looks like the, the legs are moving back into a trailing position, but indeed those are still legs. Um, and in some species, do I have a picture of that? No, I don't. Uh, but in some species like boas, Oh, I showed you in the evolution part. Certain species like uh, animals that are boas, you, uh, they do have uh, rear leg spurs, which are the remnants of their rear legs. So, again, that was some of the evidences for evolution. Uh, these animals are carnivorous, right? Sensors, chemical sensors, heat sensors. Uh, they have venom, and they can disarticulate their jaw. All makes them very effective predators. All right, let's go with the chemical sensors first. Their tongue. They have a... Forked tongue. They speak with forked tongue. Now look in the picture right. Come on, Pen. Right here. Right here in the middle on the top. I'm looking at this picture. In the top of their uh, mouth, they have an organ. It's called a Jacobson's organ. Don't worry about that. But as that, it's it's actually more specifically called the vomeronasal organ that you see right there. As the as the tongue goes out, blah, 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 chemicals from the environment get onto the tongue. As the tongue comes back in, it passes over this vomeral nasal Jacobson's organ and delivers those chemicals and the snake senses chemically its environment. Smell. That's kind of what it's doing there. It's smelling. Uh, now the vipers, vipers have their heat seekers. They have a pit. Look at the picture in the upper right. See the vertical pupil. Uh, that's an indication that you're looking at a viper. Uh, the heat seeking pit, that little hole right there. They can sense IR. They will IR, mammals, small little mammals, little mice, which is one of their big prey that they feed upon. They they can they can sense those critters with their infrared. Uh, now, of course, like I said, they're nasty little critters, and they have a dis uh, ability to not only uh, get you with the venom. There's a there's a shot you can see of a little drop of venom hanging off of there. Now, venom can be of two types. It can be hemotoxic, or is it hematoxic? It doesn't matter. Maybe it's hema. Anyway, that basically causes tissue death, tissue necrosis. People who've been bitten by rattlesnakes, rattlesnakes venom is hematoxic. Uh, if they're not treated fast enough, what happens? Happen they'll lose an appendage. <laughs> every, uh, hate this, it's horrible. Every time I've gone to a serpentarium, a place where the, somebody handles snakes, the fellow who handles the vipers always has. Let's see if I can show you in the camera. He'll have like couple of his finger tip of his fingers missing because i've been working with snakes for 37 years and i'm like he gets got bit a couple times didn't you um those are rattlesnakes uh the cotton mouth that you see here being very nice and saying hello to you there's the reason why they're called cotton mouth that bright white mouth uh but over here this is one in my front garden that i took this is actually my front flower bed it's a coral snake and coral snakes are um Ay, ay, ay. Hematoxic, neurotoxic. There you go, Steve. Paralysis. You you die by your breathing stops. They're related to cobras. They're the most venomous North American snake. Because so, in spite of the fact that Mr. Easton Diamond back down there is pretty uh, uh, intimidating, this guy's got stronger venom. Uh, now uh, the coral snakes aren't aren't aggressive. I chased this around in my flower bed with my wife screaming and having a fit for 20 minutes. But uh, you know, I wouldn't do that with a rattlesnake. A little different story. Uh, sea snakes, highly venomous animals, one of the most highly venomous animals in the world. Again, uh, neurotoxic, related to uh, cobras. Uh, not very aggressive. Found uh, in the Indo-Pacific areas. Uh, divers dive with them a lot. And they find that they actually are kind of, what do you want to say, friendly? They swim around the divers. Uh, the large anaconda, the river snake that you see down there uh, below with the uh, uh, the natives, they'll, uh, uh, they'll actually hunt these things, bring them ashore, and then and then eat them. Uh, and then the black racer there that's on my back porch. Thin, long, black snake that you see around all the time. Easy to tell from a moccasin because moccasins have a very thick body and a wider head. Uh, now, this whole disarticulation of the jaw means you can eat anything. See the picture in the background kind of right here? It's a snake that's consuming an alligator. Uh, if you look in the little inset drawing, you notice that the way the snake jaw 
is designed with that with the, with, with that that really loose hinge in the back where it's green. That means that they can open their mouth and basically disarticulate their jaws, take their jaws apart, and then swallow most anything. Holy cow! You can sense chemicals, you can sense heat, you got venom, you can disarticulate your jaw, and you're pretty mean and nasty looking sometimes. You're a pretty good predator. Right? It's kind of like uh, the crocodilians, which is the next group we're going to talk about. What are they known for? Being stealth predators, being able to sneak up on things. All right, the crocodilians. Uh, so notice the crocodilians here. Here we got the birds, and uh, and then this is the. It's really. I always got confused with this. This word up here actually means bird. An ornithologist is somebody who studies birds. So you would think that the ornith or Nishian dinosaurs would be the ones that are related to the birds. That's really not the case. It's the Saurischian dinosaurs. And so if you ever come under that complication. Um, all right, so the crocodilians. Uh, you got two dozen species of crocodilians, warm tropical climates, right, like ours. Uh, large, stealthy predators, eyes, nose on top of the head, all of this made. For sneaking up, you drive, you, you've seen them. I drive across Lake Jessup every day going back and forth to work, and I see them out there, and all you can see is little eyes sticking above, just their nose hanging above. That's stealth. They can move up on things. They blend in well with their environment when they're younger, like that little one, too. See the see the broken coloration doing really well blending in with the, with the uh, grass on the side of uh, the water. Um, crocodiles are typically nocturnal. Uh, they are uh, they are much more related to uh, birds than they are reptiles, even much more than the alligators. Uh, crocodilians and alligators are known for uh, maternal care and building nests. Uh, we talked about the fact they have a four chamber four chambered heart. Two species of alligators. We have one in Florida, the American alligator Mississippiensis. There's a picture I took of one out in the Wakaiba. Alligator Mississippiensis, because it was described first from the Mississippi River region. Uh, we also have a crocodile here in Florida, uh, not up here uh, in central Florida, but down more of the Keys. Now, it, the difference between an alligator and a crocodile, uh, alligator uh, uh, snouts tend to be rounder. Alligators are more pointed. And then up above, if you look, I've got this thing where in a crocodile, Crocodile, in both the teeth show, the upper teeth, but in a crocodile, this bottom tooth right here will show. Not that I would ever want to get close enough to tell. I love uh, reptiles, but crocodiles and alligators, man, that's that's not something you mess with. So that alligator down below climbing over a four four foot chain link fence, they can do that. The thing in the middle is a, I think that's a caiman. Uh, Gavals, Garrels, and Caimans are all uh, organisms uh, in this group as well. Much smaller group of uh, a smaller group of critters. Um, I th okay, that does for the. Uh, I believe that does it for the reptiles. Well, it does for all of those reptiles. So now we're going to go to the birds again. There, and another thing about this Ornith Ornithian and Saurischian dinosaur thing, the Ornithian dinosaurs are called bird-hipped because their hips were shaped like birds, and yet it was the Saurischian dinosaurs that gave rise to the birds. So I'm not a paleontologist. I'm not sure why it's all all wonky like that. But let's go on to the birds now. Very specialized type of reptile. Diverse, 10,000 species. The most diverse of all the reptiles uh, out there uh, are the birds. All right. Uh, many reptilian traits. Amniotic egg, that, that's not necessarily just reptilian. We have an amniotic egg, too. Scales, like on their legs. Look at the, uh, the picture of the, of the chicken up there, the scales on the, on the chicken leg. What other creatures have scales? Reptiles, right? Fish have scales. Uh, but no teeth and no tail, right? They've lost the teeth. Now, now, ducks and waterfowl have a serrated bill, but it's not teeth. Okay, no teeth and no tail. Tail feathers, but no tail. A feather is a big thing about them. Now, we talked about why feathers may have come about. Remember, they vet, they initially started for warmth, uh, but later on, fortuitous for flying. This was the key to the, their success. And where did they come from? Well, feathers came from uh, reptilian scales. More specifically, 
They came from something, a keratinous structure known as a placoid. Now, if you look over here, that's what I'm going to be using or be talking about here. We're looking from the side at the skin of an organism. A placoid is a condensation, a dermal condensation. And this one is a feather placoid. There are all kinds of placoids. Placoids can give rise to scales. They give rise to feathers. They can give rise to hair. See, when we talk about the mammals, the big difference between the mammals and the birds, as far as the reptiles go, the, the birds are the reptiles that kind of went with the hair. The mammals were, we're not really reptiles, but we went more with the first strategy of all this. Notice in a, in a young uh, chick, doesn't it, those are feathers, uh, are eventually going to be feathers. It looks like fur, doesn't it? Feather placoids and feathers came out of these dermal condensations that begin to uh, uh, what, pinch up or become a dermal papillae and eventually form this stalk. So now we're looking at the top in the last picture. So what we're looking at in essence is forming uh, now to the lower left, something like this, right? And then through evolutionary adaptation and mutations and all those things we talked about, kind of like what plants might have done when they become vascular, this began to branch. And then maybe a mutation occurred where the branching became a little more organized with say a central vein and perhaps it became denser. And then what's happening here is that fortuitous jump, okay? The difference between those two feathers is one is symmetrical and one is not. What I mean by symmetrical is it has the, the veins on one side of the central or the, the feather length on one side is equal to the other side. Notice in stage five, it's not. The ones on the left are thinner. Flight is impossible with symmetrical feathers, so animals, birds with stage four feathers like that would have been able to use them for warmth, but they wouldn't have been able to use them for flight. You got to have the asymmetrical feather. So when we see in the fossil record, the asymmetrical feather showing up, we know then we're seeing organisms that are learning to fly. or not learning to fly or developing the ability to fly. You know, feathers are really unique sort of structures. I mean, like I said, if you look in the upper right, they have all these barbs and barbules and hooks all for this idea of, of, of allowing the animal to fly. Feathers are very efficient. The way the bird moves their wings are very efficient. Um, feathers are designed in such a way so you, you get the force on the way down, but on the way up there's no, or there's decreased force. The air flows right through the feathers. Now, the little bird flying there, I wanted to remind everybody, or maybe if you don't know, that, that flying is basically kind of counterintuitive. A bird or an airplane doesn't fly by pushing the air below them. They fly by creating a vacuum in the air above the wing. The design of an airplane wing, the way the bird flaps its weathers and the uh, feathers and the de asymmetrical design of those feathers allows, as you see in the little picture, a reduced air pressure area above the bird. And below the bird is a constant air pressure area. So the reduced air pressure area above causes the bird, it's a vacuum, to float up into that reduced air pressure. Same way, same way an airplane flies. Same way a, 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 sail, a, a, a sailboat works too. Sailboat doesn't work by the uh, wind pushing the boat along from the sails. It, mush, it, it works by you positioning the sail to create a vacuum in front of the boat, in front of the sail. Ah, feathers, acceptations. Okay. Other things that were adaptations for these organisms as far as uh, flight, once we got these asymmetrical feathers, thin bones, right? Everybody knows you don't give uh, chicken bones to your dog because they're too thin. They can splinter and make the animal sick. Hollow, thin bones. A lot of the bones have been fused, especially those that have to do with flight muscle anchoring. Uh, again, a little bit of detective work. This is the... Uh, skeleton of a typical bird, that big, strong keel bone, you know, where the breast would be of the animal. A, a bones, especially with that kind of shape, are made from muscle attachment. So the large face of that bone, okay, is indicative or lets us know that there's a big muscle attached here. And why would there be a big muscle in that area of the bird? Well, that's the front breast area. You would need a big muscle for flapping wings. So we're looking at the fossil record, we see asymmetrical wings, we see e increased breast muscle uh, size by evidence of the, and, and something like that would fossilize. That's a bone. We know we got critters that are, right, getting to the ability or uh, obtaining the ability to fly. 
All right. Now, uh, as I said before, flying is expensive. You got to have a lot of energy. You got to be very efficient. So for one thing, and I kind of jump it in the bottom of the list. I'm sorry. We're gonna, uh, birds are going to be warm blooded. Warm blooded critters have higher metabolic rates. They have higher metabolic rate, higher temperatures than we do. Higher, uh, we're about 37 degrees. And you see birds there are, are somewhere around 40 degrees. So that, you know, higher metabolic rate, higher temperatures, higher temperatures, enzyme reaction rate is faster. You know, all that stuff that we've talked about. So, uh, all right, how about lightness? Number one, we talked about the bones. No urinary bladder. They're just going to pee as they fly, okay? Females don't have a backup when it comes to their ovaries. They only have one. The, uh, the, uh, the gonads, the ovaries, uh, and in the males, the testes are only going to enlarge during breeding season. They're only going to get big and heavy when you need them. Uh, actually, the enlargement of the, uh, of the gonad in the male, that's what stimulates him to sing. That's when they start singing, when, they, when, they're, when their uh, uh, gonads are enlarged. And after the breeding season, they're going to shrink again and lighten up. To be able to do something like flying, you got to be a very efficient cardiovascular critter, efficient respiratory system and circulatory system. Uh, birds have lungs and they have air sacs, which I'll get to in just a moment, explain what we mean by air sacs. Four-chambered heart, so just like us, crocodilians, birds, and mammals, four-chambered heart, increased, uh, no mixing in the blood, right? Increased blood pressure, all those things that are the benefit of a, of a two cycle like that. And increased heart rate, too. That's also going to up a metabolic rate. Hummingbirds in the vicinity of 1,260 beats a minute. Remember, hummingbirds are one of the only uh, birds, I think the only bird, really, that can hover in midair. Okay, this whole idea of the uh, birds breathing. Man, this is so cool. I wish, I think so many times of a, what kind of animal adaptations would you like to have? Well, there's another one I'd like to have. I'd like to be able to breathe like a bird, all right? Let me show you what I mean by that. Birds have a, a lung. So look at the little blue jay in the upper right. So we've got the lung, but we have these two things called front air sacs and rear air sacs. So now what I'm going to ask you to do is look to the picture down below where the schematically we've drawn the same thing. So at the bottom, once again, it's all labeled. The lungs are the part in the middle. So I'm talking about this picture here. And then the anterior air sacs are on the left and the posterior air sacs are on the right. So you make the jump between the pictures. All right. Going to start at the top. Inspiration number one. Bird takes a breath. The air that's in the red goes to the posterior air sac. Now, the posterior air sac is not just a holding place for air. It's vascularized. So the arrows that are moving out are indicating that gases are exchanging, right? That carbon dioxide is, is diffusing out, uh, oxygen is diffusing in. It does it on its natural, um, natural tendency. All right, the bird exhales. We're going to follow the same breath of air, the, the one in the red. Upon exhalation... The air doesn't leave the posterior air sac in a bird. It goes into the lungs. Now, guess what happens in the lungs? Same thing, right? Air gets, a, air gets uh, 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 carbon dioxide gets, uh, diffuses out, oxygen diffuses in. All right, now, next time the bird takes a breath, that first original breath, the one was in the red, now we're going to follow in blue, does not leave the bird, but actually goes into the anterior air sac where we get more absorption and gas exchange. It's not until the second expiration that that, that original breath finally leaves the air or finally leaves the bird. So the bird subjects that volume of air to three spots in which gas exchange can occur. Man, I tell you, now, being a runner like the way I am, I can think, man, I could run for days like this. Can you imagine how metabolically efficient if every time you took a breath in, you could get three times the oxygen or, or, or at least you could have three uh, chances of extracting as much oxygen from that as you possibly can? That's going to be something that's necessary for a high metabolic rate critter like a bird. It's also to their <laughs> – poor birds. It's also to their uh, demise, too. The picture of the guy there with the canary, that's a bird, a canary in the, in the, in the cage there. He's a coal miner. The, the idea of the old adage or thought about the canary in a coal mine, coal miners used to bring canaries uh, into the mine because gases, toxic gases, carbon monoxide, methane, even carbon dioxide will build up in a mine. It can kill people. Uh, the bird, because of the way they breathe, and the fact that they extract more per breath, right? The bird's going to die first. So when the bird dies, the coal miners need to get out. 
kind of an indicator species like we talked about with lichens. They don't use canaries anymore, but you get the idea. And you can see why now you can explain to someone why they use birds. This has been my latest obsession, bird evolution, right? So birds are uh, what we would call theraped or theropod, excuse me, beast feet dinosaurs. That's what that means. And up in the uh, upper right are four of these uh, uh, theropod dinosaurs. There's Sinosauropteryx. Now, I've highlighted and read a couple of things that are going to be significant for the immune birds, all right? Short front arms, right? We're going to concentrate on the rear legs, short front arms. Uh, body covered in those filaments that we just talked about, uh, probably used for insulation, so warm bloodedness. Now, along comes Velociraptor. We're all familiar with Velociraptor. That's the one from the Jurassic Park movie. That's the one that had that big, uh, you know, remember he has the big claw. Now, that's a big, large carnivorous theropod dinosaur with a swiveling wrist bone. Ah, why do you have a swiveling wrist bone? Well, it was really good, buddy, uh, with, with his, with his uh, hands and its arms uh, manipulating them. But that swiveling wrist bone is something we would find in a bird necessary for flight because when the wings, the wings are kind of twisting when the bird is flying, that would work very nice. Uh, all right, uh, down below, by the way, I have, uh, this is what we think Sinosauropteryx might have looked like. Definitely not like a bird, but kind of furry in a way. Uh, the next one after Velociraptor, this is Caudipteryx. Uh, Caudipteryx would have had symmetrical but flightless feathers. All right. Now notice this is a recent discovery. We're feeling it more and more so, uh, whereas Archaeopteryx that we talked about before had asymmetrical feathers. There's a lot of other bird-like dinosaurs that are fitting in this group and they're discovering new ones all the time. But, you know, so there's Archaeopteryx there, right? So Archaeopteryx had asymmetrical feathers led to their ability to probably to fly okay uh bird diversity increased during the cretaceous so along with the dinosaurs uh during this time we have lots of toothed birds with very large breast bones uh during this time so even during the time of the dinosaurs we think that the birds were probably taking the flight now one of the really neat things that i always like to talk about in science and biology is these minor little things or events that change life on earth all right i want to talk about the alula for one thing that's a cool word all right look down below at this somewhat kind of busy graph with the red arrow I, i'm showing that the diversity of birds so the diversity of birds was going through all the ones we've been talking about and then it rose the diversity very quickly exponentially just about the time that this thing called the alula appeared we begin to see the alula in the fossil record well, what is an alula? Well, uh, on a bird's wing, the alula, if you look in the middle picture, is that little reddish pink hair. It's that, it's that feather right there. It's called the alula feather. <sighs> so neat. What the alula works as, if you've ever been in an airplane, I'm sure you have, you know, the airplane's got slats and flaps on the wings. The slats are the part where the wings that come out in the front, and the flaps are the part that come out in the back. Whether you come out in the front or come out in the back, what you're trying to do is make the wing bigger. Planes use their flaps and their slats when they're flying very slow. They need more lift. So when they take off, right, and then they land. And you've seen it happen if you've ever been on a plane. Now, when they're in mid-flight, they pull those slats and those flaps in, and you're going to have less wing. You don't need quite the lift because you're up high. It's like my uh, zoo professor used to always say in college when it comes to flight in animals. If you don't have speed, you better have altitude. And you don't have altitude, you better have speed, right? So when you get up high, you can pull in the the flaps and, uh, and the slats. As a matter of fact, they create drag when you're flying. But when you're flying really low and slow, you're going to want those things open. The alula is a thumb feather, basically. It allows birds to take advantage of the same things of the height or aerodynamics that planes do with the slats and the flaps. It allows birds to be able to sustain um, a, a, a controlled low altitude, slow, low uh, low speed flight. So it gave them extra lift. Isn't that amazing? And it must have had a tremendous effect because like you can see after the Alula, we see in the fossil recommend birds started coming right after the other when it comes in a diversity, all because of that little tiny feather. Just amazing to me how many times I come across something like that. All right, so once again, here's Archaeopteryx. We've seen her or it before. The tooth beak, the claw, which is reptilian. The wing claws. Uh, that's going to be reptilian. The long tail is going to be reptilian. The airfoil wing with contour asymmetrical feathers. So here we got a flight. This may be more chickenish. 
Oh, cool. It's sitting on a ginkgo tree. So where are we today in birds? Well, as I said, there are about 10,000 species, extremely diverse, about 28 orders of living birds. I'm only going to gonna point out three, three living orders that I want to talk about, only because, I don't know, I think they're neat. Uh, the the Struthithioniformes, the ratites, these are flightless birds. These flightless birds have no sternal keel. So what we mean by that is that big bone I was telling you about that the muscles would be attached to, they don't have that. Okay, why? They're flightless. That's how you could look in the fossil record at a bird fossil and say, well, this bird must have been a one of these kinds, like a rhea or an ostrich or an emu, right? Uh, another great example of continental drift uh, of evidence right here too, by the way. These animals uh, uh, look alike because they originally they were found scattered throughout all these continents when they were together. Kind of like the lungfish I was telling the other day. But they're flightless birds, so they wouldn't have a strong uh, of sternal keel. Uh, these are the most ancient group too. Kiwis, which those weird little birds that live in, uh, in New Zealand are part of this group as well. The Spensiciaformes, which are the penguins that like to fly in water. I say fly in water because like you look at that king penguin there. They uh, basically are doing that underwater. It looks like they're flying underwater. Amazing. And then, of course, I couldn't uh, go without the birds without seeing the Passeriformes. This is the big group. Uh, came to rise in the middle of the, the – uh, toward the end, the middle of the Cretaceous. About 60% of all birds today are these birds. These are the perching birds, songbirds. Uh, down below the picture of the claw, Passeriformes birds all have that rear digit, that hallux, that first digit, digit number one. That's indicative of members of this group. I've always thought penguins were neat critters. In the March of the Penguins movie with the penguins going 70 miles over the ice and 70 miles back. And it's not that. They're not lazy. They're not flying critters. They're aquatic critters. A couple of other cool birds that you might see around. That's a cardinal in the upper left. And that's a Roman Catholic cardinal, so not quite the same. This is the red-shouldered hawk. This is the craw, craw, hawk that you hear all the time. Red-tailed hawk. Sexual dimorphism. These are called grackles. T-R-A-C-K-L-E. Male and female. Male is this guy here, the shiny one. Female is the duller one. So like in the Cardinals, it is the female who does the picking. Uh, blue jays. We have blue jays in Florida. Not to be confused with this one, which is a threatened species found only in Florida, endemic to Florida. That is the scrub jay. Scrub jays are found in Lake County. You don't see them very often, but endemic, only found in Florida. This is the Toronto Blue Jay, so not, not a bird at all. Laughing gulls, you know, the ones at the beach when you're trying to take a nap, and they're just laughing ah, 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 over and over and drive you nuts. The ones that people, unfortunately, feed Cheetos to, and then there's a million of them. Oh, the Mockingbird. Uh, I always, uh, the Mockingbird is cool. Uh, Mockingbird's scientific name is this. Mimus polyglottus, the mime, right? And polyglottus, glottus is throat. So the mini throated mime. That's cool. All right, I got one more, then I'm going to finish. We'll do the mammals tomorrow. The dodo bird. The dodo bird was a big flightless bird that lived on the island of Mauritius back, as you can see, in the 16th century. Uh, America, or excuse me, Europeans landed on the island in 1598 and began consuming these birds. They were easy to consume, or they were easy to catch, because they had no fear of human beings, and they were big, so there was a lot of food on them. The, they were given, uh, were they, the whole dodo comes from the idea that they would walk right up to the to the folks on the island who would just jump, cut their heads off, so they was, seemed to never get a fear of human beings, and in less than 100 years, they went extinct. Poor dodos. They should have known better. But you can see that's a big chicken, right? I don't remember exactly how big they were, but I think they stood like up to uh, up to like human size so for the maybe not quite human size, but a big bird. All right, uh, I'm gonna stop there. We'll do the mammals tomorrow, so let me let me stop the recording.